art goal is... What if a brand was exclusive? You're going in on bottom shelf. You're not getting top shelf space. Most beauty companies have anywhere between a 50 to 70% gross margin versus, you know, looking at a food or beverage company, they're running in the kind of 30% gross margin. Um, are you finding that there are specific categories that you like? Everything always goes back to the product. How does it actually change the market as well? In beauty, in food, in anything, like it comes down to they had a cult following. Hello, I'm your host, Mike Gelb, and this is the Consumer VC Podcast, brought to you by Propeller Industries, the leading strategic finance and accounting partner for venture stage companies. On this show, we discuss the intersection of venture capital and consumer innovation. And if you're joining the show, please subscribe on YouTube or whichever platform that you're viewing this content. And if you're really, really enjoying the show and you want to stay in the loop, I highly recommend subscribing to my newsletter at theconsumervc.com. You'll receive all new episodes right when they're released and as well as fundraising updates weekly of all the consumer deals that are happening. All content and episodes are for informational and entertainment purposes only. It is not investment advice. Our guest today is Sarah Wolfel, who is a co-founder and managing partner at Cult Capital. Cult Capital helps catapult merging cult favorites to mainstream success with truth and authenticity. Some of their investments include Supergoop, Babo Botanicals, and Lawless Beauty. We focus this conversation primarily on investing in emerging beauty and personal care brands, which we don't cover nearly as much as we should on this show. Um, what are cult brands? We cover that as well. And the ideal outcome when investing in brands from an investor's perspective and how she thinks and approaches portfolio construction. Without further ado, here's Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me here today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for taking the time. So since you are cult capital, I got to ask, what makes a cult brand? It's a great question. It's, um, it's interesting because we, when we initially launched the firm, John and I, uh, back in, let's see, it was 2015, late 2015, we initially named it after his initials, JMK. And uh, after three years or so of looking at potential investments together, we developed this notion of investing in cult brands. And we you know, would always say, like, what is this brand doing that's actually different, that's actually doing something that is changing consumers' lives for the better? And we would kind of always go back to that question as our touchstone and we realized that the commonality amongst all of the brands that we had invested in or were interested in was that they had a cult following and a community of, you know, organic followers who were very passionate about the brand and very passionate about the brand's vision, mission, and values. And of course, the product it itself and the product product itself was life-changing for the consumer. So um, a, a year or so after we, we renamed Colt to Colt Capital, um, and we then kind of took the name a step further and actually defined what a Colt brand is. So we have an official Webster dictionary definition for it. Um, and we say, um, you know, that it's a brand that changes the world by providing a product that otherwise would not exist. And if it didn't exist, the world would be worse off in a meaningful way. Um, and so it's a brand that, you know, consumers really can't live without. And uh, as a byproduct has a very loyal following that uh, is very excited about the brand and engages with the brands in a very passionate way, um, therefore creating this amazing cult community. So that that is how cult capital defines um, a cult brand. How do you measure that then um, when you're looking at brands and thinking of, is this a cult brand versus not a cult brand? Like, how do you measure that, um, that it's, that, that, um, 
um, the brand's customers are, you know, super passionate about the brand and, you know, that is, that it's actually very, uh, sticky or that it's, you know, making sure that it's organic and, um, in terms of maybe how they grown, not that, you know, um, they, they can't go acquire, um, a via paid, uh, what have you, but, but how, how do you kind of put all these things together? Yeah, it's another great question. If we've spent a lot of time and invested a lot of time in building our team to have, um, you know, very specific metrics that we're looking at, we analyze both qualitative and quantitative data to really ascertain whether something is a is a cult brand. Um, in terms of, um, you know, it really is a blend of both qualitative and quantitative at the end of the day, and I. I do think that makes cult capital pretty differentiated within the investing landscape. A lot of investment firms are really, really good at the quantitative, but not necessarily as focused on as focused on the qualitative. But we've really kind of drilled deeper on the qualitative side. On the qualitative side, you know, in the first instance, um, it's looking at USP, which is you know the the product's unique selling proposition. So really laying out, you know, whether it be a food brand or beauty brand, like what are the exact ingredients and what is the potency of those ingredients and are they clean? Are they not clean? And how does that compare to all the other brands in the competitive set? So not just, you know, what's the, the brand's like mission or values, but drilling a level deeper to make sure that a true USP really does exist. Another thing we look at, um, obviously, is product market fit. So how much do customers value the product? A lot of that can be demonstrated through um, product reviews, which we really go through a lot of times manually to decipher what customers are actually saying about the product. Um, and when we're we're doing that, we look for for indicators that it is, for example, replacing something in their routine or quote change their lives or never going back. So really, words that that kind of speak to it's doing something that no other product has done for them. Um, community engagement. We look at social media metrics. Um, obviously now those, those are pretty widely available. So we're looking at engagement rates, um, across the, all social media platforms to really understand how relative to peers, um, the brand is resonating with consumers. We look at, um, one of the more interesting things that we look at is, um, when kind of, uh, deciding, you know, whether a brand is interesting or not. How are consumers learning about the brand? A really good indicator of a cult brand is when you see a high percentage of um, of consumers learning about it through word of mouth. That really means that there's this evangelical following. Um, so those are on the qualitative side. On the quantitative side, we're looking um, at a lot of the metrics that speak to loyalty and repeat purchase behavior, doing cohort analyses, looking at loyalty programs and tiers, understanding you know what products are resonating specifically with customers and why. So looking at sell in and sell through by product, by retailer, um, evaluating unit economics. Um, and then really blending both the quantitative and the qualitative together um, to understand the story behind the numbers and, and kind of bring all the pieces together. So um, that's a little snippet into the diligence process for us. I appreciate that. How how do you think as well about um, category and what category is interesting to you? I mean, l- looking at your portfolio, I know it's, it's, it seems a lot in mostly, I would say in like the beauty and personal care space, but, um, are you finding that there are specific categories that you like, and it's a bit more kind of top down and your, you, you and your team are kind of doing research in terms of what are the new trends in that specific category, or is it a little bit more bottoms up? Would you say in that, you kind of want the founder to kind of bring you like a unique insight or something that maybe you haven't thought about before, um, where, where could, where, where, um, this could be the, the, the direction, um, that particular category is headed into. That's a really great question and something that we're constantly evaluating quite honestly, um, and kind of revisiting, 
uh, we think of it in particular, you know, we have always thought of it and continue to think of it as a blend of both of those things, Mike. So we're looking uh, kind of bottoms up and our, our, our sourcing model is based on, you know, just what are the companies out there and what's interesting. And we're constantly surfacing new companies across all the, the verticals that we look at, which are food, beverage, beauty, personal care, fashion, apparel, accessories, household, pet, leisure. So, you know, it is a wide variety of categories. Um, When we think about what has resonated and what has been most interesting to us, a lot of it has been in the beauty space. We're really looking for like mission-driven visionaries, like I said, who who are looking to change the world for the better. I think the other thing that is um, prevalent in the beauty space is just higher margins. So return on investment tends to be better in the beauty space. Um, You know, most beauty companies have anywhere between a 50 to 70% gross margin when, and when versus, you know, looking at a food or beverage company, they're running in the kind of 30% gross margin zone to 40% gross margin zone. Um, So when we think about, you know, what needs to be the case um, in order to get excited about an investment in food versus an investment in beauty, the bar is higher for differentiation in food just because there's less money for marketing and team building and those types of operating expense buckets versus in beauty because the margins are, are higher. Um, there's more room on the the PL to kind of invest in marketing, invest in team, invest in different channels. Um, so that's that's to date how we've thought about it and and how kind of we've landed where we have landed, which is investing, you know, the majority of our capital in the beauty space. Got it. Got got it. So I mean be- Beauty and personal care has been has been attracted to you, obviously, from a gross margin perspective. I mean, in terms of like comparing it to food and bev, there's obviously trade offs here. I, mean, I know we're speaking kind of broadly when it comes to different categories, but even though food and bev obviously has less margin, you, you you're probably going to have if a customer loves your product, and of course, if you have a cult brand, um, your your repeat rates will be higher in in the food and bev categories because, of course, you know you're you're obviously consuming those categories within one sitting. Whereas in you know beauty and personal care, you're you're you're, you're not right, and so. Um, 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 and so, yes, you do obviously have like gross margin um, of the, that benefits, but at the same time, in terms of the, the repeat rate for beauty personal care, it also is going to be less than than food and bev. Yeah, and I think you know it's category dependent as well. I think in food, when you think about like Miyoko's Creamery, like someone's coming back and buying vegan cheese or butter, um, you know, once um, once every other week, you know. Um, when you think about, you know, the subcategories within beauty, hair care, the purchase frequency is maybe quarterly, skin care is monthly, cosmetics, you know, varies widely. A lot of those products are one-time purchase items like palettes and specialty things like that. Mascara, something maybe per- someone purchases a couple times a year. So it definitely varies um, by category. And, and we take all of those things into consideration as we think about, um, you know, what is the bar for this brand and, and does it clear our investment hurdle? Is there a sweet spot when it comes to um, when when a person would actually repeat um, that that you like, like wh- whether it's like a monthly purchase, for example, or like quarterly, or if it's something w- that's in, within like two weeks? I, again, I think it's category dependent. I think if we look at a brand and see that over 30% of customers come back and and, and purchase within the first three months or so. I think that's a really good sign of, of cult adult adoption. Um, but again, it, it really does vary by category. And we've had brands that we've invested in that, you know, we've kind of helped develop that repeat purchase as part of the investment. You know, it, it does require, you know, a strategy to really be able to bring back the customer um, over and over again. And an investment. So, at, at what stage do you typically get involved with in in the company from like a revenue standpoint? Yeah, so we are you know getting involved pretty early. Our minimum threshold is is last twelve months revenue of of two million. 
Um, so anywhere, you know, companies are typically anywhere between that LTM 2 million to, to 10 million mark at the time of our initial investment. And usually our goal is to scale the business to somewhere between 50 million of revenue to 100 million of revenue over a, a five to seven year period. Um, and we're, we're investing in the Series A um, typically or Series B rounds. Um, we're doing all minority investments and really looking to collaborate deeply with founders and, and their executive teams um, to help them grow and scale. I'd say most often um, the things that we're working on initially are building out a senior leadership executive team. So most of the time when we initially invest, there might be the founder slash CEO and you know, one other senior person and a lot of junior people. So what we're, you know, really specializing in is helping companies grow that team and then develop systems and processes under sales and marketing and expanding distribution channels for the brand. Well, speaking about distribution channels, like when you do invest um, or look at a brand and the brand is, and we're kind of availing a, a and a brand is attractive to you or could be attractive uh, could be attractive to you um do they have to have like a varied um like a couple different like sales channels for example like for example do they have to be in retail um can they only be online or or um or how how are you thinking about it from a sales sales channels perspective or does it not as much matter for us, it doesn't necessarily matter. We like to see the desire to be omni-channel and the goal to be omni-channel. So we want that to be the end goal. But a lot of the brands, I mean, the, where we typically are investing is between, I'd say three to five million of revenue is probably the average of where we've started investing with brands. And in many cases, you see that they've grown predominantly with one specific channel slash retailer, whether that be through Sephora or direct to consumer. Um, Acton Acre is a good example of a, a, it's a hair care brand we've partnered with that was exclusively, you know, basically direct to consumer at the time of our investment. And so it's not, um, it's not critical to show proof points, but what we do, it does make the bar higher for performance in that channel. So if you are exclusively direct to consumer, you know, we're really doing a lot of diligence to understand the strategy there, make sure the unit economics make sense um, and want to see, you know, that that channel specifically is viable as a, you know, 40 to $50 million revenue channel. Yeah, that's what I've heard from, uh, some folks more in like the private equity sphere where you might have a very compelling D2C brand, but they're, um, or rather brand that is only D2C or, or only selling um, uh, to the website. And there's not enough margin for them to actually go um, into wholesale. Um, but, but, but so, so um, like, how do you identify, I guess, apart from margin, um, what do you kind of identify in terms of will a brand actually work that is maybe doing really well D2C if that brand will actually be be a compelling brand in wholesale since, of course, the majority of spend for uh, consumables happen in, in, in wholesale um, retail? Yeah, I think it goes, a lot of it goes back to that brand love. Um, when we think about, for example, someone like Acton Acre, um, we invested in them. They they were not, they had not launched in Sephora. Now they have launched in Sephora. They're on .com and they're in 250 doors. Um, they're on the next big thing wall in hair care. And I, you know, we had a lot of confidence going into that brand. I think some of like the big picture things when we looked at it and were like, this is a great brand and this is going to be successful is A, the product. They were taking a revolutionary approach in hair care. So looking at 
the scalp, they have very in a way, innovative ways of, of thinking about the scalp as, you know, skin care for your head because your your scalp is essentially an, an extension of the skin on your body. Um, the founder herself is a celebrity hairstylist and also a trichologist, so has a lot of knowledge about hair care and could really speak to the ingredients and the formulas um, and the quality. And then we look at sort of, you know, I think for beauty in particular, the PR strategy is really important. So one of the things that Sephora, you know, really gets excited about with brands is if they have a really amazing PR strategy, um, because if you're thinking about it for from Sephora's perspective, to bring in a new brand and to, to give shelf space to a new brand, they want to bring new consumer, they want that brand to be able to bring new consumers to Sephora, right? So that's, that's a lot of, you know, what we focused on for that brand, for example, I don't think there's a playbook per se, but it's putting together, you know, what are the three or four tenets that make this brand really compelling for retail? What if a brand was exclusive in, in Sephora or exclusive on a particular channel? Is that is that a vote of confidence for you? Or is it also at the same time, okay, maybe this is somewhat limiting as well? Yeah, so we've dealt with exclusivity quite a bit with our brand. So um, Supergoop was exclusive to Sephora for a large part of our investment in that brand. Um, they were, you know, I think exclusive since the time we invested in 2015 to right before, you know, Blackstone bought a majority. So that was around six years. Um, and, um, and then, you know, we're also invested and partnered with Lawless Beauty in the clean cosmetics space. Um, that's a brand that has, um, you know, dabbled in exclusivity with Sephora, so it's a very common ask um, from Sephora, um, and we are, you know, we're very comfortable with it. It's a vote of confidence from Sephora. We do, you know, they, they don't make it totally exclusive, so you can sell through other smaller vo volume marketing channels, um, and you can sell direct to consumer, um, and um you know, the, so, so there are places to, to, that you can also sell through QVC, which both Supergoop and, and Lawless sold through QVC as well. Um, so there are other ways, um, to really get the brand and brand message to consumers. Um, so we view it, you know, largely as a positive, but going back to just, you know, how convicted we need to be heading into an investment like that, you know, we had a lot of confidence in Supergoop um, at the time of our investment and a lot of confidence in, in Lawless at the time of our investment. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, well, how, how do you overall like think about, I guess, specifically within beauty, beauty and personal care, you know, trends or innovation within the space. I know that's like, like a very broad question to ask because there's so many different kind of avenues within beauty and personal care. But for example, like, I mean, I listened to, um, uh, I listened to Holly uh, from Supergoop's um, podcast on how I built this. And I guess the insight, part of the insight there, um, apart from having like a, you know, incredible product, I'm a, I, I, I love the product. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Supergoop uh, fan. Um, and also, um, and also um, wear it um, uh, quite often, but the insight that the uh, but the insight I remember her saying that was really interesting was that like when you go to like elementary schools or you go to schools like there's actually should be they actually should have sunscreen for uh, for kids because you're out in the sun all day and that you know that's gonna um, deteriorate your skin not is, is is not so great for your skin so you should um, really be having like sunscreen every single every single moment of the day, like on pretty much, it should be part of your, you know, daily routine, um, and kind of incorporate with it, which, um, apart from having like a, a superior product, if of course the customer is buying uh, is using subscreen, uh, way more often then of course, you know, that's, that's fantastic. Um, uh, but so, um, how, so that, of course, that, that, that's one example. And I applaud you for obviously making that, um, um, investment there, but how, how are you thinking about like innovation in like, in like today for like other, other types of categories. Yeah. So I do, 
it is a multi-pronged answer. So what I would say at the uh, at the highest level when you think about a product and a brand and what it's providing, we look and say like, what is this company trying to do? So are they, is their innovation, is it growing the market size in a case like Supergroup? So Supergroup was actually the mission was to change consumers' daily usage patterns for sunscreen and get them to wear it every day. So in addition to taking market share from from existing players in the market, the goal was also to expand the market, right, and make the, the total addressable market for sunscreen larger. When we look at a company like Lawless Beauty is a great example, um, you know, that company is providing clean cosmetics for consumers who are, are um, who want artistry driven products. So products that have very high efficacy, a lot of clean brands prior to Lawless were focused on more of a minimalist makeup look that was more of a natural makeup look. And Annie said, hey, I actually, I like my face to look like I, you know, a magazine ad. And I like makeup that wears and performs and looks amazing. I like glitter. And so I want to create a makeup brand and clean that does that. So if you look at a company like Lawless, that's more of a pure market share uh, play, not necessarily dr- growing the total addressable market for cosmetics, but really trying to take market share away from other players in this space like NARS and MAC um, and a lot, of, a lot of the big players that aren't clean today. Um, so, it, so the innovation bar really starts there around what is the goal of the company and why? So what do we need to be focused on? And in the case of, of Supergoop, you know, one of the great innovations was the unseen sunscreen, which is literally something that can be applied every day. You don't feel it on your face. It feels weightless. It's clear. You can wear it if you're a, a male, female, um, under makeup, over makeup. You know, you can really wear it any which way. So that was a huge innovation for that brand. Um, a huge innovation for Lawless has been in in lip, and that's been you know a growing category within cosmetics um, in particular over the last year or two. And um, she created a really innovative lip plumping formula um, that is, uh, it's called Forget the Filler, which is a very catchy name, um, but really meant to, you know, act like, um, you know, a traditional lip plumper, but doesn't have the sting that's typically associated with it. And it's a beautiful, shiny finish um, lip formula. So, um so, you know, it, it starts with what the brand's trying to achieve, goes down to product. And, and then I think, you know, the key really is innovation is is really important, especially um, in beauty, but really across the board, it's important in food as well. Like, I think in a, in a world where everything is so crowded, there's so many investors, there's so many companies being started every day in consumer um, and there's a lot of fast following. Social media has driven a culture, you know, has driven a dupe culture. People um, are are duplicating innovation quickly. Co-manufacturers are are duplicating trends and back solving for formulas quickly. Um, so I think the key is to have a well oiled machine in innovation. So you need an innovation lead and people who are really developing and planning out the pipeline on a on a daily basis you know it's it's like marketing it's like sales it's like any other function within the company and pd and innovation is an area where you know people need to be spending time daily um as a team and and everything that is you know decided and done should be rooted in the company's vision and mission and what the ultimate goal of of the brand is This episode is brought to you by Propeller Industries. If you run a high growth business and you're focused on profitability, extending your runway and improving your operational efficiency, you probably need a finance and accounting whiz that will grow with you. 
Well, instead of hiring someone full time, what would be cost effective is working with Propeller Industries. Propeller Industries is a leading strategic finance and accounting partner for venture stage companies and has partnered with over a thousand startups and high growth businesses across consumer products, consumer tech, and enterprise. Some of the brands that they've worked with are Liquid Death, Olipop, Hymns, Farmer's Dog, Away, Movie Pass, and Giphy. Propeller also provides specialized support for fundraising and M&A with transaction advisory services. Propeller's TA team of former investment bankers and investors can step in on more of a project basis when pursuing full-scale financing and M&A. There's a link to Propeller Industries in the show notes if you want to learn more information. Um, I, I really appreciate that response. What I, what I kind of, my takeaway there is that it, it starts with the product and it also with the product, how does it actually change the market as well? So in the fact with like super, super goop, you know, the fact that it was, um, it was, um, a sunscreen that was really easy to put on. You can put it on, you know, under makeup, you, you can put it on, you know, anytime it's just very, very, um, it's not really that it's not really thick right? It's um, uh, just very, very easy to put on. Well, okay. And also promoting the fact that, hey, you should have on sunscreen every day. Um, it shouldn't just be, it should just be like when you go to the beach. It should also be, you know, um, um, if you're going outside at all in the day, which hopefully um, hopefully you are at some point, um, that that you should have it on. Okay. Like how does it actually change the market? And I, li- and I like your response about how um, it actually grew like like the TAM of the market um, um, in terms of who would actually, you know, wear front, uh, sunscreen, but also like frequency too, um, since you also be putting on it daily rather than, you know, maybe only on the weekend where maybe you're outside for, for, for a lot more, um, a, a lot more time than, than during the week. Um, um, and so how does it also cha- uh, change the market? And also is it, are you trying to take away market share or are you expanding the market where, Hey, maybe it actually doesn't matter as much if we actually need to take market share or not, because there's the the market is so wide open than we even thought it was. So, um, uh, but at, but but again, that like all stems kind of back to the product, right? It does. Everything always goes back to the product, um, and 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 most importantly, the mission, right? Like Holly, that was the origin of her mission. Unfortunately, the kids' piece was too hard because. It's an o- it's a regulated product product and schools can't bring in you know OTC related products to schools. So, but she you know it really was how do I get people to do this every single day all day? And you know she's done it. In the case of Lawless, you know Annie is said I don't want why are consumers using NARS and MAC when there are clean alternatives available? Just no one's done it. No one's taken the time to create artistry products in clean makeup. Um, and, and she's, she's done it. Um, so, um, it, it does, it goes back to the product. It goes back to the founders kind of initial vision and mission for the brand as well. I, I also really appreciate that, but, uh, but, but I mean, back to a little bit as well on the, on the distribution side, which I think is interesting. Cause like getting into Sephora, for example, really challenging, right? Um, um, and I remember that I remember that you said that um, you know part of um, part of what Sephora um, that you need to think about too when you enter Sephora is also what is your PR strategy? What is kind of like the marketing too of the brand? But since you've since you've invested in and brands have been you know some of your brands have been really successful when it comes to being in Sephora. I know that you obviously aren't at Sephora, but in your mind, as you've kind of helped guided brands into Sephora or seen brands work well in Sephora. What, in your opinion, are like maybe some of the attributes that they need to have in order for in order to maybe get a shot you know, in, in, in terms of getting into Sephora? Yeah, it's, you know, it is so competitive. I think the quality of the product is so, so important. That's in beauty, in food, in anything. Like it comes down to, does this, you know, unless the quality, you could have a founder say, I want to make, clean makeup, right? But unless the quality of that product is better than alternatives on the marketplace today, people will not switch. So vegan cheese, for example, Miyoko's Creamery sounds nice, but does it taste as good or better than regular cabbage cheese? Like that's the question that has to be answered. And that's where you get real fundamental change in the marketplace when the actual attributes 
of the product and the, and the taste profile and the, the quality profile is just as good as existing conventional alternatives. Um, and so I think when it comes to Sephora, that's the bar you're being measured against. So they, you know, to them, clean is interesting. Yes, we need to invest in clean. We want to invest in clean. But how are you going to compete with our biggest players? Like, how do you measure up to a NARS? How do you measure up to a Charlotte Til- Tilbury? Um, in hair care, how do you measure up to an Olaplex? What's the messaging that you're sending to consumers? Is it differentiated? Does it have a point of view? Does it have a perspective? Um, in a, you know, amongst a sea of competitors, why is the client going to come come in and be interested in your product over other products? And when you think about initially even going into Sephora, you're going in on bottom shelf. You're not getting, you know, top shelf space, like, you know, perfect presentation, like, and you're looking pretty shoddy, like it's, it's, it's a fist fight. And so you need to be able to have um, the marketing prowess as well to bring the customers into their store, specifically seeking out your product. Um, and so that is why the bar for entry into a place like Sephora is so high. You really have to have the product nailed down. Um, you have to have the marketing message and channels nailed down to the consumer to bring consumers to Sephora to buy your product. And then you have to have the operational capabilities to service, you know, a, a complicated retailer like Sephora. I guess this also goes back to a bit of what we were talking about with margin, of course, because price is obviously directly related to margin. But how, when you're analyzing brands too, how are you thinking about price as well and in terms of how they're actually pricing themselves? Because that's what's also really tough. I mean, as, as we talked about, you have to have a superior product, right? But and, and of course, you know, there probably is some innovation that happened there. But with innovation, there's also a cost too for that, right? And so and so usually that means higher prices. How how are you kind of analyzing when you're thinking about brands that um because one of the big like phrases that kind of comes on this show a lot is we want to invest in brands that make it also more accessible to like the consumer. And it's like, well, you know, a lot of these brands as well. Um, are actually priced, you know, are, are premium price and they, and they, and they unfortunately have to be. Um, so how, how are you, how do you think about price in, in the seat that you're in? Yeah, I think we want it. I, you know, I, I would, I accessible, I think is a good word, but I take it a step further, I guess. And I say accessible luxury. I think it's a phrase. I think Tori Birch actually coined it. Um, I think she's, a really incredible businesswoman, and um, and really, yes. I I think you know when it comes to accessible luxury, like she really nailed it, and her brand is amazing, and what she's been able to do with her products is amazing. Um, but so I think of it as accessible luxury. No, it's not accessible. We're actually investing in things that are are more luxury priced for you know their category but it's accessible, right? So we're talking about smaller price points. We're not talking about $5,000 Chanel bags. We're talking about um, a $20 mascara, maybe versus someone was previously spending $14 on a conventional mascara. So it's a slight price premium. In return, you're getting something that much better for you. And that's Again, where product and differentiation and innovation come into play, you need to have that give forget with the consumer. Like, I could buy this fourteen dollar mascara that's conventional and might do bad things and cause cancer to me, um, or I could buy this clean mascara that also has like all these other benefits and is twenty dollars. So you have to have that like price value trade off. Um, but we all always are constantly like doing a deep dive on on price. Um, and making sure that the brands, you know, that we're specifically investing in are kind of middle of the fairway for, for wherever we are playing. So if it's a clean brand, middle of the fairway for clean. If it's a vegan cheese and butter brand, you know, middle of the pack to sometimes upper pack for, for you know, vegan cheese and butter. So we never want to be like the most premium price product, but I like to think of it as accessible luxury. 
Got it. That makes that makes um that makes sense in terms of um as well how you think about pricing. Um not of course like the super, super high end um in terms of the pricing wise, in terms of like u- ultra premium, but at the same time, um at the same time it is gonna be premium. Um uh because of course too, like, you know, a lot of these companies are they're they're not at scale yet, right? They're still exactly. um, obviously like 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 a, a emerging brands. So hopefully the yes. goal is that you're gonna get like 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 lesser and lesser uh, prices, but Over of course that time. comes to scale. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Over time, more is possible um, and innovation is possible. Right. But um, kind of at the starting point when you're dealing with, you know, such smaller quantities and and, um, you know, smaller scale distribution without a lot of cost savings, um, you know, the price tends to sit in, in a little bit of the, the higher zone versus the lo- lower zone. What's the pulse right now? When it comes to Series A and Series B investing in beauty, are are you finding that um, like a lot of investors are writing checks? Are you also finding like what's kind of the status when it comes to multiples as compared to maybe twenty twenty one? Feel free to take it away. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a hot topic these days. Um, yeah. So there's, um, I would say overall, I'd say the temperament is cautious optimism. That's the way, and maybe I'm just cautiously optimistic myself, and that's why I say it's cautious optimism. But um, I, I think that um, there's definitely still an appetite on on founders we have um, to find capital and to find capital partners. Um, and there's an appetite on investors' behalf to to invest in great brands. I I think you know we've sensed over the last couple of years um, some some hesitation and uncertainty in the marketplace. I think everyone's aware of that. In the second half of last year, we saw a record number of convertible notes. So companies were just doing convertible notes, unpriced rounds. Um, buying some time with capital, kind of waiting out to see what would happen with market conditions. Would they improve or not? Um, Many companies during that time made a huge push to shift to profitability. For some companies that just entailed, um, you know, for a lot of companies that entailed kind of pursuing an omni-channel strategy if they were DTC only, um, so you've seen a lot of DTC only brands try to shift into retail to gain more brand awareness, um, with Omni channel being sort of the most capital efficient way to grow. Um, and then I, I'd say, you know, over the course of the last six months or so, we have seen begun to see more priced rounds in the marketplace. I know you post you post a lot um, on what is happening. Um, so I think you know we're seeing more more priced rounds. but people are cautious and and quite frankly, valuation multiples have come down um, I, I would say pretty materially from the peaks. Um, so I, I you know I think, what were the peaks? Just, just, just kind of wondering on the, on the multiple side. Jeez, I mean, in the the frothy, the frothiest. Um, you know, I'd say looking at, you know, companies that were doing five to ten million of revenue and getting, you know, anywhere from sixty to hundred million dollar valuations. Um, so, so yeah, there's yeah. So like, like 10, so like, so like 10, 10 times multiple, um, or even higher. Yeah. I, I think that's what was happening in the peak market. Um, and so we've, which was obviously a huge increase from where, you know, we started this journey at Coal Capital. Um, and I kind of laugh thinking about the, the pendulum swing. Um, but I, I do think, you know, multiples have come down considerably since then. It's a more rational market. Um, we're very excited. We just closed our second fund. And so now have a second fund to, de- to deploy. Um, and so, you know, we think this is going to be a great, great vintage um, and a great time to be deploying cap- capital. There's definitely um, a lot of quality brands out there. 
um, and valuations are um, are more in line, are, are just more aligned. And I think, and I think, you know, hopefully the lesson learned for everyone is that, um, is, is, is that, you know, I think, I think a lot of founders thought like, you know, highest valuation, highest valuation, highest valuation, um, without kind of thinking about what happens on the flip side. And I think, you know, if it a lot, it, when you take a valuation that, that that's that high, there really is no room for error. And, you know, the, the more conservative way, but, you know, still risky way to grow, you know, a business um, is to take a valuation that is, um, you know, more achievable. And we like to say, like, you, you want to grow into that valuation over the next and exceed it over the next 12 to 18 months, especially if you're going to need more capital. Um, so to have a path, I think, to, to be able to comfortably achieve that is really important. If And in terms of the multiple side, um, since I know you gave a kind of example of, uh, of what it was previously, has that, has that come down to, would you say like three to five X typically, or what was like? Yeah, I'd say, I'd, I'd say three to five X. The category dependent still, but I'd say that's a general rule of thumb. I remember, you know, you said, and also I see this on, on, in the, um, on socials a lot, this kind of shift to profitability, um, and, um, you know, get profitable and not, and, and, you know, uh, emphasize profitability over growth and what have you. Um, uh, but is that a bad sign if, if for you as an investor, um, and you want to achieve, um, the returns you want to achieve if a company actually wants to get profitable at this point? Because you actually want them to achieve like that kind of fifty to a hundred million dollar um, revenue standpoint in the next like five to six years. I think it's a really good question, Mike. And I had this with one of our partner companies the other day. You know, like the company was asking, like, what is like what growth profile like would you want to see in a perfect world? And and my answer to that is. I want to see profitable unit or break even at least unit economics. So when I think about, you know, if I'm looking at profit by channel or profit by um, DTC, you know, unit economics, I want to see profit, but I want you to be investing ahead of the curve in things like team or, for example, you're ramping an influencer strategy that's going to pay off for us over the next three years. And we're making a huge investment in that right now. I, those are the types of like needle moving things that we want to see brands investing in. So it's really people, specific marketing tactics, um, things where there's a measurable um return on investment, I guess, is the way I would describe it. And not all things are measurable, but but I think that's probably the easiest way to describe it. I mean, we never, when we looked at brands, like never wanted to fund product costs. Like that's just not a good thing to fund. We want to fund scale. So we want to fund market marketing tactics, sales tactics, investing, heavily investing in a sales team, heavily investing in education. You know, I think Supergroup is a great example where education for the consumer was a huge hurdle. So that did require a huge marketing investment to get that message across to consumers. Um, so that that's really what we're looking for. So we're not so focused on, um, you know, seeing break even um, on a P&L statement but we want to know your your unit economics are solid, your your economics by channel are solid, and that we want to understand the specific things you're investing in, causing the unprofitability to grow the business um, at scale. So you want to, yeah, I mean that that's a great question of, um, I guess maybe when it's a great kind of analysis and great measure in terms of when you actually do receive, you know, um, outside capital. What are you actually spending that capital on? Um, and when does it make sense to actually use equity versus debt? I think that, you know, in the past few years when the market was, you know, red hot and interest rates were really low, um, that 
um, founders maybe would raise these, some of these big rounds and a lot of them would be actually to finance on the inventory side um, and inventory spend. Where I think it's quite interesting because I would have thought, and again, I'm not a founder, but I would have thought that, and, and also it's easy to say this, obviously 2020 in hindsight, but I would have thought with interest rates being so low, it's actually a great time for debt, right? It's a great time to actually use a debt market in order to actually fund that inventory rather than, you know, giving up maybe larger pieces of your business or, you know, having this event where you're, you know, um, trying to raise, you know, a certain amount of money and you're using that actual equity dollars in order to actually use on the inventory side. Um, um, of course, this market's this market's quite different. It's expensive both ways. Um, um, it, it's 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 you know the debt market is obviously expensive, and, and and certainly companies have become a lot more selective in terms of which um, um, which which companies they want to actually I- issue credit to, and at the same time on the equity side too, right? Um, um, it's definitely more of like an investor market than it is a than it is a uh, uh, like a founder or or brand market. So. Um, Uh, But I do think that is, I do think that is like a really good point in terms of how are you actually using, you know, your equity dollars and and what it's actually using for and, um, and when to actually makes, when it makes sense to actually use debt versus equity. Now, of course, young brands may not actually have access to debt markets yet. Um, I'd imagine at like two, at at like the two to $5 million um, kind of threshold that, that, that that you all have, they probably do have access to the debt markets, but um, that is like a really interesting point in terms of. Um, when it actually makes sense on the uh, on the equity side to actually use it and to kind of go toward and do that kind of big swing, which whether it's like an influencer led led um, a, like a, a influencer strategy that maybe will pan out with, within three years. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, and I think to your point, like most companies can start accessing you know inventory capital. I'd say around five million of revenue. So normally when we invest, we start talking to debt capital sources. Um, but I, you know, sometimes they get a little earlier. It just depends on how much actually the sometimes depends on how much equity they have um, invested. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, between two, five, two and 5 million in revenue, like you should always try to finance inventory with debt for the most part. I mean, that, that just makes the most sense. Um, when you want to make long-term investments in team marketing strategies, things of that nature, I think that's where you, you should think about equity. In your mind, can we talk a little bit about like, what is the ideal outcome for like a cult capital brand? I know that it's obviously that they kind of scale within like the three to like, like that kind of five to seven period um, um, to a point. But like, is is for example, is it like an acquisition when you're thinking about brands as well to invest in? Is that kind of in the back of your mind? You're thinking of okay, who would be potentially if 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 everything kind of goes right, or I know nothing goes perfectly right, but if everything kind of goes um, roughly right and um, and and this does become a big outcome, like what what does it actually uh, like? making sure that there's enough, you know, like strategics or, or would a strategic actually be interested in this company? With all that being said, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit, but like, what is like the ideal outcome for um, Colt? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great question. And that's what we're in it for. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> great exactly. brand. And then, and then the ideal outcome. Um and, you know, building some amazing relationships along the way, I'd say, like, you know, Holly of Supergroup is, she's one of my friends, you know, like that, I think that's the amazing part, right? Like she created a, a, an amazing product. She's now like a close personal friend of mine. Um, and and it just, it's it's awesome to go through something um, so personal and so game changing with someone so inspirational. But what I would say is on the exit side, you know, we like to be completely transparent with the companies that we're partnering with and the founders that we're partnering with. Our goal is to generate, you know, four to six times our initial investment. Um, that's not, you know, a small goal. That's a large goal. Um, but we we do like to be really upfront about it to make sure, you know, that founders are aligned with us and in, in how we're thinking about it. Um, it's really important that everyone is clear kind of on, you know, is there an end game? What does the end game look like? Are we all aligned around a potential outcome? And it doesn't mean anything gets set in stone or, or anything like that. It's just that 
kind of our our dreams and our goals are aligned, right? Um, I think um, when we think about exit options and exit path, there's no um, one set way. I'd say probably in looking at history and what's happened in um, in kind of the consumer space is the most likely kind of outcome is an exit to a strategic player. So in beauty, that would be a L'Oreal and Estee Lauder, Cal, Unilever. Um, in food, it, 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 it could be, you know, Nestle or, or Kellogg. Um, and so, um, you know, we are, we're open to obviously strategic exits. We're open to, in the case of Supergoop, where we sold a majority stake to Blackstone and a larger PE player, open to um, to exit outcomes like that. Um, and then there's there's IPO. So um, I think all options on, are on the table. I don't think it's something that's predictable from the outset with companies. I think one of the things I like to test for when I'm talking to founders is kind of, you know, if a founder says like, oh, I, I only want to IPO, you know, that's probably not a founder for us. Um, you know, we want someone who's open-minded, is, is more focused on um, kind of the goal than what exactly the uh, format of that is going to look like at the end of the day. Um, you know, we, we are, you know, investors at the end of the day, right? We are taking capital from other people to generate a return. Um, and so we are aiming for um, an out, some type of exit outcome in, in five to seven years. Um, so those are, those are all the things that are on the table really is an exit to a strategic, an exit to a larger PE player or an IPO outcome. Um, and I think I kind of named them in, in order of most most likely outcome given given history. From the team side of things, since I know that's you know where you um, spend a lot of time in terms of constructing maybe the executive team and think about what the leadership um, 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 is, or you know, or if there's someone as uh, someone else you should bring along. When does it, in your mind? And I know this maybe depends on on the company, but um, uh, I know this happened in, in uh, fairly recently in one of your companies. When does it make sense to that maybe um, like the founder um, actually uh, who who might might be the CEO um, that it maybe makes sense to actually bring on like another CEO um, through like the next stage of growth? Yeah, I think it. You know, it's also company dependent. Um, I think in the case of Supergroup, it made a lot of sense ahead of an exit. I think that you know Holly had been had been CEO of the company since two thousand seven. She's still heavily involved in the brand, um, but didn't want to be CEO kind of under the next person's ownership. So so Amanda. Baldwin, the president at the time of, of the sale, transitioned into the CEO role about, I think it was 12 months or 18 months ahead of a potential um, transaction. So, um, you know, I really think it depends on the founder, um, how involved they are currently, how involved they want to be in the long term. Um, I know like, Bobby Brown's a great example of someone who's super involved in our company for a really long time. Um, Other founders put, you know, 10 years of work into it and want to stay close to it, but don't want to be doing the day to day of driving the team and being responsible for the team's kind of KPIs and outcomes. Um, And so it makes more sense to kind of transition to a, to, to another CEO to kind of run the day-to-day of the business. Um, so we lean on the founder um, who, like you said, in most cases is also the CEO to um, to really guide us to what what is the right timing and, and what is the right outcome. What's one book that's inspired you personally and one book that's inspired you professionally? That's a great question. I read a lot of books, actually. Um one that uh, that is one of my husband's favorites, and he's 
talked about since we were we met in college and he's talked about since we were in college together was how to win friends and influence people it's a classic by dale carnegie and um and i think that that has been a guiding like book for me i think one of the key things in um my husband also i mean he's he's been such a partner to me and kind of obviously life, but also professionally, he's been an amazing like resource to me. Um, And one of the things is, you know, he always said to me is, you know, you can't make people do things. You have the best way to like get someone to do something is to make them want to do something. And that's one of the guiding principles in that book is, is to make people want to do things. And I think that's super applicable to minority investing. I think one of the biggest challenges of being a minority investing is like having a lot of experience seeing the way things unfold across companies and then working kind of with companies um, to help um, make change, but not being in the position to be able to make the change. Um, so to me, that kind of advice of making people want to do things has resonated really strongly with me, um, and has helped me both personally and professionally. Um, another book, um, that I read that I liked a lot at the suggestion of, um, one of our senior executives at Supergroup was, um, the book on uh, measure what matters. I don't know if you've read it, Mike, but um, really great book on OKRs, um, which is, you know, objectives and key results and setting up, you know, accountability amongst the team. And I think it, you know, the book goes into a lot of detail, but even if you read kind of the first half of the book, um, it sets a really good framework for how to think about goal setting within an organization and how to set up accountability and um, and just team structure that is is really you know well positioned to to make an impact and to scale. Um, I think so much of what these companies do, you know, going back to product, it always starts with product founder mission, but then it's team and execution. Um, once you get to that five to ten million mark, it really, in order to scale to a hundred, it comes down to team. Um, and so I think that that's a great framework on how to align a team around goals and objectives um, and hold people accountable. No, that's great. And, and measure what's what matters. That's by John Doerr, right? Yes, um, exactly. Cool, 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 awesome. Yeah. That's, that, that's great. I haven't read that one yet, but, um, how to win friends and influence people. That's one of my favorites. Um, uh, I think that's so, it. so great. Always, always, always ask questions. Um, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Um, we actually, uh, we have a book club at Colt Capital and we read, um, we read like, we try to read a book quarterly that's related to, you know, something. So we've, we've actually read both of those for, for our book club. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, well, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, for coming on. This is a lot of fun. Thank you, Mike. It was awesome. Love chatting with you about all things consumer. Thank you. And there you have it. It was a pleasure chatting with Sarah. Sarah, thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. Really enjoyed our conversation. If you're enjoying the show, if you're on you, if you're watching on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you're doing it, if you could please hit that subscribe button, that'd be awesome. Um, and if you really, really, really like our show. Please subscribe to the newsletter at theconsumervc.com. You'll receive weekly consumer fundraising updates of all the consumer deals that are happening. And you'll also be notified when a new episode is out weekly. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Propeller.